Good day students! For today, we are going to tackle about NPNs or the non-protein nitrogenous compounds or substances. So these NPNs can also reflect the functions of your kidneys. That's why they are also called as the kidney function test. For the learning objectives, at the end of this lesson, you are all expected to identify the parts and functions of kidneys. Determine the different NPNs and their clinical implications. And lastly, differentiate pre-renal, renal, and post-renal azotemia. Now let's differentiate NPNs and proteins. So first, proteins are high in molecular weight. That's why they are also called as macromolecules. As opposed to that, your NPNs have low molecular weights. Another thing, your proteins are colloidal in nature. So they're opaque and Again, they are large. That's why when they are present in a specimen, they cause turbidity or haziness. On the other hand, your NPNs are crystals in nature. So usually they don't cause turbidity or haziness in your specimen. Now let's take a look at the urinary system. So first we have the kidneys. Of course, their main function is they filter the blood and attached to them are the ureters. And next one, we have the urinary bladder in which this is the area where the urine is being stored. And lastly, the urethra from where the urine is being excreted. And also, we have the major vessels here. So the blood from the heart will pass through this large artery known as the aorta. So the blood will pass through from the aorta and it will be delivered towards the kidneys via the renal artery. And of course, once the blood reaches the kidneys, it will be filtered. So all toxic materials and unnecessary substances will be excreted through the ureter down to the bladder and of course to the urethra. And the filtered blood which contains substances that are needed by the body will be returned to the bloodstream via this renal vein. So that's how the blood flow in the kidney happens. So your kidneys, they only weigh less than 1% of the total human body, but it receives about 25% of cardiac output. So looking at this illustration, we can say that the kidneys are full of blood vessels, such as this artery. We also have these arterioles and of course the capillaries that surround the entirety of your kidneys. That is why, as what I have mentioned, the kidneys can hold about um, approximately 25% of the entire blood supply at any time. So for example, um, we can have approximately 1.1 liter per minute of our blood flowing through our kidneys. So for a normal person who has about 5 liters of blood, it would mean that within 5 minutes, all of the blood has already passed through the kidneys and it has already been filtered before returning to the bloodstream. Now let us dig deeper to the different parts of the kidneys. So first, the blood coming from the heart will be delivered to the kidneys via this renal artery. So we can expect that the blood coming from the renal artery is oxygenated because it comes from the heart. Next one, the renal artery will branch off into smaller vessels. So this is what we call as the renal arterioles. So once the blood reaches the kidneys, it will be filtered and the reabsorption of ions and necessary nutrients will also happen here. And all the filtered blood will be collected into this vessel. So we call it as the renal vein. So from the renal vein, it will be delivered to the bloodstream to the rest of the body. So that means that the blood coming from the renal vein has lesser oxygen. So it's deoxygenated because the oxygen has already used up in the filtration and reabsorption process occurring in your kidneys. Next one, we have the outer part, this one. We have the renal cortex. And the middle part here, this portion, this one, this is the renal medulla. So what I want you to take note is the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney, is situated between the cortex and the renal medulla. So if I am to illustrate the nephron, so first it will be in the renal cortex, then it will fall down this renal medulla back to the cortex down to the renal medulla. So this one, this is the functional unit of the kidney, so this is your nephron. 
and you have millions of nephrons per kidney because the kidney contains approximately 1.5 millions of nephron. So those are again the functional units of your kidneys. Another thing, we have the first part of the kidney where the urine is present or the first part that comes into contact with the urine is this one. So these tips here, those are your renal calyx or the plural form of that is the renal calyces. So the renal calyx or renal calyces. Another thing, all the urine that was gathered from the renal calyx will be collected to the central part of the kidney in this area. So that is what we call as the renal pelvis. So the urine will be collected from the pelvis down to the ureter. So this one, this is the ureter, down to the urinary bladder, and then to the, to the urethra. Next one, if there are tubes or vessels that are coming out in an organ, for example, in this case, the kidneys, we call it as the hilum or hyla, just like this one. The renal artery, the renal vein, and the ureter, together, they come out in a renal hyla. So this one, we call this area as the renal, renal hilum or renal hyla. So that's the area where the vessels are coming out from your kidneys. So I hope you already have an idea on the blood flow in and out of your kidneys. So first, again, we have here the renal artery, which will branch off into smaller arterioles. So if I am to illustrate that one, I have here the renal artery, and again, it will branch off into smaller arteries. So we call this again as the arterioles. So it's actually the arterioles that will meet your glomerulus. So we have here the tuft of capillaries. We call this as our glomerulus. So your glomerulus is the one that filters the blood. So actually, the arteriole that first meet the glomerulus or the arteriole that is going towards the glomerulus, going towards the kidney, is specifically known as the afferent arterioles. And the one that is coming out or has left the glomerulus is what we call as the efferent arterioles. So what's happening here is that the blood coming from the heart will be delivered to the renal artery, towards the afferent arterioles, and now towards the glomerulus and towards the efferent arteriole. And eventually, this efferent arteriole will turn into a capillary, then as a venule, and eventually it will become as a renal vein. So this renal vein now will be the one to return the filtered blood to the bloodstream to the rest of the body. So that's how the blood flow in the kidney happens. So you might be wondering why there's a lot of fluid leaking in this area, but it doesn't happen anywhere else in our body. Just like for example, sodium, glucose, amino acids, and other smaller molecules can leak out from the arteriole in this area towards the Bowman space. So how does it happen? So if we enlarge this one, so let's say I have here your glomerular capillary. So this one, this is the enlarged version of that. So these glomerular capillaries, inside of that, you can see like, for example, smaller molecules such as sodium, glucose, and also you have here large protein molecules. So since they are large, normally they cannot pass through the blood vessels. So you have to take note that the lining of this capillary are filled with these cells. So we call it as your endothelial cells. So these endothelial cells, they are fenestrated or they contain fenestrations. That means they contain holes or pores. So the holes will allow these smaller molecules to pass through the glomerular capillaries toward the Bowman space. And other proteins are also allowed to leak through it. But larger proteins can't leak towards the Bowman space because there's another layer that sits in between these endothelial cells. So it's like a membrane, but it's not a complete barrier. So this one, we call it as a 
basement membrane. So this basement membrane is semi-permeable. So this one, this is the basement membrane. So this basement membrane makes sure that small things can pass through this glomerular capillaries, just like your sodium, the amino acids, the glucose. But the bigger proteins bounce back either because they can't make it through the fenestration or the basement membrane prevents them from leaking into the Bowman space. And lastly, we have another layer. So we have here the tubular cells. So they are like long cells. And these tubular cells make up the interaction point on the end of the Bowman's capsule. So again, they are like long cells and sometimes their structure looks like they are anchored to the endothelial cells. So they have these leg-like projections, so just like this one. So they could have this leg-like projection. So we call it as podocytes. So podocytes, so podo means foot. So these podocytes, in addition to these tubular cells, okay, will help that the connection between the endothelial cells and the basement membrane will stay close. So that's how some of the substances passes through this layer of cells while other substances such as larger proteins cannot make it through the fenestration or cannot make it through the basement membrane and eventually to the tubular cells. So not all substances can pass through the glomerulus towards the Bowman space. So as mentioned, the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney, lies between the renal cortex and the renal medulla. So you have here the cortex and the medulla. And each of our kidney contains, again, 1.5 million of nephrons. So let's have now the parts of this nephron. So first, the main site of filtration is a tuft of capillaries known as the glomerulus. Another one, we have this Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule. And then... We have the proximal, proximal because it's near to the glomerulus, convoluted, convoluted tubules. It's convoluted because the structure of this PCT has a lot of twists and turns. That's why proximal convoluted tubules. Next one, we have the loop of Henle. So we have the descending limb and the ascending limb. Next, we have the DCT or the distal, distal convoluted tubule. So distal because it's somewhat away from the glomerulus and convoluted tubule. And lastly, we have the collecting duct. And you have to take note that this collecting duct contains many DCTs here or distal convoluted tubules. So those are the parts of the nephrons. So the PCT reabsorbs a lot of electrolytes such as the sodium and also other nutrients such as the glucose. And of course, because again, sodium is reabsorbed in this area, water is also reabsorbed in the PCT. And another thing, for the loop of Henle, we have the descending limb and the ascending limb. So they have an opposite direction and they also reabsorb different kinds of things. And you have to remember that the renal medulla here is very salty because there are a lot of ions reabsorbed in this area. So let's have the descending and the ascending limb. So the descending limb reabsorbs mainly water. So this one, it's permeable to water but impermeable to ions. On the other hand, the descending limb does the opposite because this ascending limb is permeable to ions such as sodium, chloride, and potassium, but it's impermeable to water. So because of this, because of the opposing direction of the ascending and descending limb, we have this system, what we call as the counter-current counter -current multiplication. Counter-current owing to the fact that the limbs of the loop of Henle have opposing direction. Multiplication is because that means um, when we reabsorb ions in the ascending limb, so it will make the medulla salty. So with that, by not reabsorbing water here and only ions are allowed to be reabsorbed here, 
that drives water to be reabsorbed passively in this descending limb. So passive means the water is reabsorbed without the expenditure of energy. And in the ascending limb, active transport is used um, to reabsorb ions. And by actively pumping ions into the medulla and no water is reabsorbed in this area, so this one, this portion here, will become very salty. So the amount of water that are passi passively reabsorbed in the descending limb can then be multiplied. And all the substances that are reabsorbed um, in your kidney go to the space which we call as the interstitium. So the space here in the kidney, so that is your interstitium or the interstitial space. Next one, we have the DCT here. So this DCT also reabsorbed other ions such as sodium and chloride. So it sort of picks up more of these important nutrients that are needed in our bloodstream. And if we take a look at the structure of the nephron in the kidneys, so the DCT actually passes through or comes closely to the glomerulus. So when that happens, when the DCT comes closer to the glomerulus, it creates this structure known as the juxta glomerular apparatus. So this structure is mainly responsible for controlling our blood pressure. So that's in the DCT. Next one, we have the collecting duct. So the collecting duct, it's the one that gathers all materials that has not returned to the blood and dispose it as urine. So the urine will be disposed here. So again, from the nephron, the urine will go out and will touch first the renal calyces down to the renal pelvis down to the ureter. So that is how the kidneys dispose those filtrate and unnecessary substances out of our body. And also, you have to take note that water is also reabsorbed in the collecting duct. And, and then, aside from that, aside from water, urea is also reabsorbed from the collecting duct. This urea is one of the main waste products of the kidney. So it's reabsorbed in the collecting duct just to help maintain the osmolarity of the medulla. So when the ions are reabsorbed in the ascending limb and urea is reabsorbed in the collecting duct, so that means it will drive again the passive reabsorption of water in the descending loop of Henle. So to sum it up, the blood coming from the renal artery will pass through this renal arteriole which will eventually pass through the glomerulus and will be filtered in here. And the toxic substances and unnecessary materials will now be caught in this Bowman space down to the proximal convoluted tubules down to this descending loop of Henle, towards the ascending loop of Henle, towards the distal convoluted tubule, and eventually to the collecting duct, and that filtrate will now be discarded as urine. And the filtered blood, those that contains necessary materials and necessary substances which are needed by the body, will pass through this efferent arteriole. And then, that efferent arteriole will branch off into smaller capillaries. So this smaller capillaries will now collect all the remaining materials coming from the interstitium. Because it surrounds your nephron, this is what we call as the peritubular, peritubular capillaries. And eventually, this peritubular capillaries will branch off as this renal vein. So this renal vein will now return the filtered blood coming from the kidney towards the bloodstream to the rest of the body. So that's how the blood is being filtered and reabsorbed and delivered from the heart towards the kidney and out from the kidney to the rest of the body. So again, the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. So the nephron is consists of glomerulus and the tubules. So the glomerulus mainly functions for filtration and the tubules mainly function for reabsorption and secretion. Another term, so the glomerulus again is wrapped in what we call as the Bowman's capsule. So the glomerulus plus the Bowman's capsule collectively we call them as the renal corpuscle. 
So another thing, the main difference between reabsorption and secretion is that when we say reabsorption, all the materials in the tubules and all the materials reabsorbed from the interstitium will be returned to the blood. So that is from the tubule to the blood. So that's reabsorption. Opposite to that is the secretion from the blood towards the tubule. The main functions of the kidneys. So first, excretion. So this means elimination of metabolic waste products through the formation of urine. And again, we have three main functions of the kidneys when we are talking about excretion. So this is the job of your nephrons. So glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Next one, we have the synthetic function of the kidney, meaning to say the kidney is capable of producing a lot of substances. So we have here the substances produced by your kidneys. So first, we have erythropoietin. So you have to remember that EPO or erythropoietin is produced by your kidneys. But the action of this erythropoietin is towards your bone marrow to increase the production of your red blood cells. Another thing, we have the renin. So this renin will regulate the water and sodium balance in the body, especially if you have low blood volume or low blood sodium. So this renin will get activated in order to maintain homeostasis in these substances. Next one, we have prostaglandins. So these prostaglandins um, are also having a function in maintaining the balance of the fluid and electrolyte in the body. Another thing, your prostaglandin also functions for uterine contractions and also in lowering the BP. So those are the substances mainly produced by the kidneys. Next one for the metabolic function of the kidney. So we have here first inactivation of aldosterone. So I just want you to take note here that this aldosterone, the main function of this is it reabsorbs reabsorbs sodium and it excretes potassium. So any defect or any imbalances in this aldosterone level will lead now to imbalances to your sodium and your potassium. Next one also, it activates your glucagon and your insulin. The glucagon increases your blood sugar and your insulin lowers your blood sugar. Another thing, your kidney is also the main site for the activation of vitamin D to its active form, which is the vitamin D3. And another thing to make this happen, so how can the kidney convert this vitamin D? So the vitamin D that we get from sunlight or we get from the supplements that we take, so this kidney will transform it into its active form. Because without the kidney, this vitamin D cannot be used up by the body. Since, since the vitamin D that we are acquiring from the external environment is still inactive. That's why when you have chronic kidney diseases, for example, you can expect low levels of vitamin D. And another thing, we have this formation of creatine. So this creatine is very important for muscle contractions. And to sum up the function of the kidney, so we have here the mnemonic, a wet bed. So the kidney is mainly responsible for the acid-base balance, for water balance, electrolyte balance, toxin removal, blood pressure control, erythropoietin production, and of course, vitamin D metabolism. So let's have now the different non-protein nitrogenous compounds found in the body. So the major NPN that is found in the plasma is the urea but we have also other constituents so this is in decreasing order so after urea we have amino acids uric acid creatinine creatine and ammonia so the ammonia is very toxic that's why very very little amount can be found in the blood so to make it easily remembered so we have anemonic all underarms create cheesy aroma Let's have first the major NPN found in your plasma. So we have the urea. So the urea is the major product of protein catabolism. So you have to remember that the body is unable to store proteins or amino acids. So that means when excessive amount of proteins are ingested, 
the excess amino acids produced from these digesting proteins are transported from our small intestine towards the liver. And that is also the reason why this urea is formed in the liver from this carbon dioxide and ammonia, which is again a toxic product from the deamination of amino acids. So I hope you still remember the basic structure of your amino acids. So it has a central alpha carbon, it has an, a hydrogen atom, also it has an amine group here, carboxyl group, and of course the R group. So that's just a review of the basic structure of your amino acid. So what will happen now is that when the amino acids are absorbed by the liver cells, a series of chemical reactions begin. So the amino acid now is oxidized in the presence of an enzyme catalyst in your liver. So again, we have this process, the amination. That means there is a removal of the amine group and together also with the hydrogen atom. So this reaction will produce a toxic product we call as the ammonia. So that's the product of the amination of the amino acid. And take note, ammonia is highly toxic. So therefore, it cannot be allowed to accumulate. So with the help of specific catalysts in the liver cells, the carbon dioxide now will react chemically with this ammonia that was produced. So once the carbon dioxide reacts to the ammonia, so a less toxic um, nitrogenous compound, urea, is produced together with water. So that's how the urea is being produced. So it is coming from the ammonia. And next one, we have the urea, 90% of which is excreted and partially around 10% are reabsorbed along with water. And also, because this is an NPN, so it's smaller in size as compared to proteins, so it's readily filtered from the plasma by your glomerulus. Another thing, your urea is one of the most popular tests for assessing renal function. However, this is not that specific and sensitive because 70 to 80% of glomerular destruction must occur first before there is an increase in the level of plasma urea. And another thing, the concentration of the urea in the plasma is an indicator of renal function and perfusion. So when we say perfusion, it refers to the blood flow. And also, the dietary intake of protein will also be reflected by the level of your urea and the level of protein metabolism. Because again, this is the major product of protein catabolism. And next one, the measurement of plasma urea is further enhanced when the results are considered together with the serum creatinine because again your urea is not that sensitive remember your glomerulus has to be destroyed first around 70 to 80 percent must occur first before the urea will be increased unlike your creatinine which is more sensitive to urea test another thing your urea is um, greatly affected by the intake of your proteins in your diet whereas your creatinine is not affected by the protein diet. So let's go now to the clinical significance of this increased urea level in the blood. So we have here the term azotemia. So this refers to the increased or elevated concentration of urea in the blood. So it's divided into three types, the pre-renal azotemia, the renal azotemia, and post-renal azotemia. And also, we have another term, the uremia. So this is also an increased urea concentration in the blood, but the main difference of this to azotemia is that this one, the uremia, is accompanied by renal failure. So there is this what we call as the uremic syndrome. So for the pre-renal azotemia, this is usually related to the renal circulation or the flow of the blood to the kidneys. But you have to take note that in pre-renal azotemia, there is a normal function of the kidney. So that means your kidneys don't have any problem at all. But again, the problem is on the flow of the blood towards your kidneys. So what are the conditions that contribute to pre-renal azotemia? We have congested heart failure, we have shock, hemorrhage, and dehydration. So all of these conditions slow down the flow of the blood towards your kidney. So for example, in normal conditions, 
the urea goes through the kidneys for excretion and reabsorption. So that's, that's for the normal individuals without these kinds of diseases. But if you have pre-renal problem because of these diseases, for example, the urea doesn't make it to the kidneys to be filtered. So what will happen now, there will be an increase or build up of urea in the blood. That leads now to this condition, what we call as pre-renal azotemia. And we have here other related conditions for pre-renal azotemia. We have high protein diet because again, the urea is greatly affected by protein consumption. And also, we have muscle wasting in cases of starvation. We have glucocorticoid treatment and of course, increased protein breakdown in cases of stress and fever. For the renal azotemia, this time around, it involves now your kidneys. So there is a lack of ability of your kidneys to function correctly. So that means your kidneys have a decreased ability to excrete substances. And one of that is your urea. So just like, for example, if you have acute or chronic renal failure, glomerulonephritis, tubular necrosis, chronic nephritis, or polycystic kidneys such as this one, so that means your kidneys are affected, so it has no capability to filter the urea. So the urea will stay now in the blood, leading to renal azotemia. So in post-renal azotemia, usually the function of your kidney is also normal, just like your pre-renal azotemia. And you don't have any problem in the blood flow towards your kidneys. So what is happening here is there is an obstruction in the flow of the urine from your kidneys and also there is an increased diffusion of urea from the renal tubules into the circulation because again, there is obstruction, there is blockage. And post-renal azotemia usually comes from the issues in the ureters and bladder. So like for example, if you have kidney stones or for example, you have UTI or tumors for example. So what will happen now is that the urea cannot be excreted out to your urine so it stays in your blood leading to post-renal azotemia. Next NPN, we have the creatinine. So this creatinine is the main storage component of high energy phosphate needed for muscle metabolism. And you have to take note that this creatinine is the anhydride, anhydride of creatine. So meaning to say, the creatinine is formed once the creatine loses water and it is not reused in the body's metabolism. That's why your creatinine is all only a waste product. And another thing, this is also synthesized in the liver from three amino acids. You have the arginine, glycine, and methionine. It is filtered and secreted and not reabsorbed. That's why you only have very, very little amount of creatinine in your blood. And unlike your urea, as what I have mentioned earlier, this is less affected by intake and excretion, such as the intake of proteins. And also, this is most commonly used in the assessment of GFR or the glomerular filtration rate. We can see elevated creatinine in the blood in cases of skeletal muscle necrosis or atrophy because as what I have mentioned, this creatinine is the anhydride of creatine. And the body content of creatine in normal men usually is proportional to the muscle mass. So if we have this um, skeletal muscle necrosis or atrophy, we can expect elevated levels of creatinine in our blood. And next one, we have increased creatinine if there is a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Next one, we have this test which is commonly performed in the laboratory. That's the creatinine clearance. So it's reported in ml per minute. So for the formula, it's urine creatinine multiplied by 24-hour urine volume over serum creatinine multiplied by 1,440, which is the minutes in 24 hours. So this creatinine clearance, meaning to say we need two specimens here. So we need to have the serum or the plasma of the patient. And also, we need to collect urine specimen from the patient for 24 hours. So, to make it short, we have creatinine clearance is equal to urine creatinine times the volume of the urine in 24 hours over the plasma or serum creatinine 
multiplied by 1,440, which is the minutes in 24 hours. So let's have an example here. So a patient with 24-hour urine volume has this 2,000 ml urine, and the urine creatinine is 50 mg per dl, and the serum creatinine is 1 mg per dl. So let's now calculate the creatinine clearance. So creatinine clearance is equal to urine creatinine multiplied by the volume of the urine in 24 hours over the plasma or serum creatinine multiplied by 1,440 minutes. So applying the formula, we have CC is equal to 50 mg per dl. So we have 50 mg per dl multiplied by 2,000 ml over the serum or plasma creatinine, which is 1. So we have 1 mg per dl multiplied by 1,440 minutes. So we have to cancel this one. So that would give us a CC of 69 ml per minute. So that's how we get the creatinine clearance in the laboratory. Another NPN is the uric acid or the urate. So this is the breakdown product of nucleic acid and purine catabolism in humans. So the purines are normally found in foods such as the liver, dried beans, peas, and beer. And at a normal blood pH, which is 7.4, more than 95% of uric acid in the body fluids exist as this one, monosodium urate. Also, you have to take note that the uric acid formation occurs only in tissues that contain the enzyme xanthine oxidase. So this xanthine oxidase is mainly responsible or mainly involved in purine metabolism. It will catalyze the oxidation of xanthine to uric acid. And the highest levels of this xanthine oxidase um, are found in the liver primarily, but it can also be found in the heart, in, in the pulmonary and adipose tissues. So all of these tissues that contain the xanthine oxidase, um, the uric acid formation could also occur in here. Also, 90% of the uric acid are reabsorbed through active transport. And also, this uric acid is synthesized in the liver and also in your intestine or in the intestinal mucosa. For the clinical pathological relation of uric acid, we have, of course, here a disease known as the gout, which comprises of heterogeneous group of disorders such as this one. You can see hyperuricemia. So hyperuricemia, that means increased uric acid. And aside from that, we have attacks of acute inflammatory arthritis. So you can see here inflammations in the hands, also, for example, in the knees and also um, in the foot of the patient. So usually in the joints of the patient. Next one, there is deposition of monosodium urate crystals throughout the body. And because of that, the patient is also prone to nephrolithiasis or kidney stones or calculi. And also, we have here some of the pictures of the patients with gout. Next, we have the ammonia. So this ammonia, as mentioned earlier, this is toxic to the body and this is disposed as urea. So the ammonia is derived from the bacterial action on the contents of our colon and it's metabolized by the liver normally. So by the process of the amination and also with the help of the carbon dioxide and water molecule. And also... The increase in plasma ammonia, again, is very toxic, especially to our central nervous system. So that's why most ammonia is ultimately disposed as urea. And also, for the clinical pathological relation of ammonia, we have here altered ammonia metabolism occurs in severe liver diseases because this ammonia cannot be removed by the liver. So it stays in the blood. So it's increased in the blood and it could affect our central nervous system. And in children, we have this condition known as RACE syndrome. So this is an acute encephalopathy associated with hepatic dysfunction, but without hyperbilirubinemia. And the survival, it reaches to 100% if plasma ammonia concentration will be maintained below five times the normal. And normally in this 
Um, Reusin room, the cause is unknown, but it is usually associated with aspirin consumption, especially in children who were affected with viral illnesses. And in this condition also, both the liver and the kidneys are affected. Lastly, we have the amino acids. So these are readily absorbed in the renal tubules by active transport and only less than 5% are excreted in the urine. That's why after urea, this is the most abundant NPN. For the clinical pathological relation, so increased urinary excretion of amino acids fall under two major types. So we have overflow and then renal amino acidurias. For the overflow amino acidurias, it is usually caused by increased urinary excretion of these amino acids because there is an increased plasma concentration of amino acid. And this is also caused by acquired secondary or inborn error of metabolism. For the renal amino aciduria, so it's obvious that the one that is affected here is the function of your tubule. So there is diminished tubulary absorption of amino acids. Also, with acquired secondary or inborn specific or non-specific disorder of renal tubulary absorptive mechanism. So the problem here lies in the fact that your renal tubules cannot easily reabsorb the amino acids. That's why you have this um, increased urinary excretion of amino acids. So that ends my discussion. I hope you have learned something. Thank you so much.